Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to this morning's service, both all of you that are here and all of you that are at home. My name is Anita Stabler Hussey, and it is my privilege to be filling in for Pastor Chuck this morning while he is off spending some quality time with his family. Pastor will be back next Sunday, rejuvenated and hopefully not too much more excited. <laughs> um, please join me in the opening in an opening prayer. Father, as we prepare ourselves for the message from you to us this morning, please open all of our hearts and minds to be fully in tune with to you. Help us to be ever minded of your plans for us. In your name we pray. Amen. Rose, do we have any announcements? Yes, good morning. Uh, first thing that if you are here in the sanctuary and you have Wi-Fi on your phone, we do ask that you turn it off to help with the bandwidth when we stream. Uh, Long Hill Blueberry Festival is next Saturday from 10 to 3 in Trumbull. Uh, trustee Zoom meeting, 7 p.m. Tuesday. If you would like to join in on the Zoom meeting, just contact the office and we'll get you the uh, Zoom link. Uh, don't forget to wear your name tags. If you don't have one, please contact the church office. And that would include myself because I can't find one. So uh, I'm not sure if I got everything. Yes, member session coming up in September. So, so um, would you all like to please rise for the call to worship? The Lord is my shepherd. I have everything I need. He lets me rest in fields of green pastures. And leads me to quiet pools of fresh water. He gives me new strength. He guides me in the right path that he has promised. Even if I go through the deepest darkness, I will not be afraid, for you are with me. Your shepherd's rod and staff protect me. You can bear a banquet for me where all my enemies can see. You welcome me as an honored guest. And fill my cup to the rim. I know that your goodness and love will be with me all my life. And your house will be my home as long as I and now please join me in the opening prayer. Heavenly and gracious Lord, we come to you with hope, love for you and one another in our hearts, and faith that you will help each of us to listen to your wants and desires for each of us as we put our needs into your hands and then open ours to yours. You see us as we really are, and not as we want you and others to see us. Help us to be mindful of you and your love always. Amen. Our first hymn this morning is Standing on the Promises, number 374.
as shepherds following our Lord and doing his work. Please continuing to be safe, turn to your neighbors, pass the peace of our Lord and Savior by waving and saying, peace be with you. Please be seated, everyone. Um, before Cheryl starts her children's time, um, I just want to say thank you to, first of all, Pastor Chuck, and to everyone here who has been helpful and helping me get through this and getting it together and everything else. And I just want y'all to know how grateful I am. So thank you. Okay, now is our time for No Disciples, which... I see several. I see several young disciples out here. Okay, they may not be under three feet, but I see several. So we're going to go forward, and who knows who's online? So we're going to go ahead with it. Ah, oh, you know what? I am hungry during church. Is anybody else hungry during church? Yes. Yeah. Need a little snack or something? Did anybody? Is there anybody in here? Would you like to share with anybody? <laughs> well, lucky for you, I brought my little snack bag here. Okay, and I've got um, five pretzel rods and two little goldfish crackers. So um, I don't. I see more than that many people. Well, we can break the pretzel. No, still not going to be enough probably for everybody to, to share. Well, I could. Just, no, I'm willing to share, but I don't think it's going to be enough to go around, right? And which reminds me. A Bible story. So, probably some of you know this story. Jesus is out with his, his disciples. And they've been all day sharing the word of God, right? And they were tired. And they were out on a boat and they were coming in to rest. And when they arrived at this little spot to get some food, right? There were people there that were very excited to meet Jesus, right? And there weren't just a few people. There were tons of people, right? They couldn't even count how many. They estimated 5,000, and that's just the men. So we know there were probably at least double that, right? With women and kids. And Jesus, who was exhausted, said, oh, man, you know, I thought I was going to get to it. But he was so excited to see all these people and had so much love for them that he forgot he was tired, and he continued on sharing with them the word of God and teaching them about heaven and the life thereafter. And for hours, right? And so guess what happened at the end of that? People were really hungry. Hungry! Everybody was hungry, right? The 5,000, 10,000, all those people were hungry. The disciples were hungry. Jesus was hungry. So they did the same thing that I just did and said, yo, anybody out there, got any food you can share? Well, before that happened, after the disciples said to Jesus, Jesus, send everybody home so they can eat. And he said, I'm not sending them home. We're going to feed them. So they reached out, just like I did. Anybody have anything? Anybody? Anybody? Silence. The one little boy came up with his lunch. It wasn't in a bag like this. It was probably in a basket. But it was very similar to this. Five loaves of bread and two fish. Now, how would that little boy think that was going to be helpful to this crowd of people? Well, he didn't know. He figured maybe everybody had five loaves and two fishes, and then he was just one of several people coming forward, right? And they would gather it all together. But he wasn't one of several people. He was the only little boy with this that he was willing to share. Now think about how hungry everybody was. He probably had his family there. They could have had a nice meal out of that, right? But no, he shared it selflessly, brought it to Jesus. Jesus blessed it. And then you know the end of the story, right? Suddenly, there was enough food for everybody, everybody, everybody. Not just a little snack, not just a little broken piece of a pretzel, but enough so that they were all completely satisfied. But that's not all. Jesus then sent his disciples out and he said, take your baskets and gather what is left. And they came back with 12 baskets full. How in the world did that happen? Well, maybe if I put this out and we maybe bless it on the altar, maybe we turn. No. 
Because we can't do that, right? But Jesus can do that. Jesus can make that happen. Now, he didn't have to have a little boy come forward, right? But he was showing the crowd that one little boy with his ordinary little lunch could make this all happen. And so what is that showing us? I think what he's trying to say is one little boy, one little girl, one of each of us, right? If we bring whatever we have and we're willing to give it to Jesus, that he will make extraordinary things happen out of our ordinary things. But we've got to do it, right? We've got to bring, if I brought my lunch bag, I'm willing to share, right? What do you have that's ordinary that God wants to use? to feed the thousands. Please join me in prayer. Dear Lord, Dear Lord, Lord thank you for that little boy. Thank, thank you for that little boy. boy. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for Jesus. Help us to be that selfless. Help us to be that selfless. And turn our ordinary things. And turn our ordinary things. Into extraordinary things. Into extraordinary things. That will help others. That will help others. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. First reading this morning comes from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that, according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may <clears throat> excuse me, have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. The word of the Lord. rise for the reading of the gospel. The gospel comes in two parts this morning. The first part is from Matthew 14, one, well the whole thing is Matthew 14, 1 through 21. The first part is pertaining to the death of John the Baptist. At that time, Herod the ruler heard reports that Jesus, and he said to his servants, this is John the Baptist. He has been raised from the dead, and for this reason, these powers are at work in him. For Herod had arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because John had been telling him, it is not lawful for you to have her. Though Herod wanted to put him to death, he feared the crowd because they regarded him as a prophet. But when Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodias danced before the company and she pleased Herod so much that he promised an oath to grant her whatever she might ask. Prompted by her mother, she said, give me the head of John the Baptist here on a platter. The king was grieved, yet out of regard for his oath and for the gifts he commanded to be given, he sent and had John's beheaded in the prison. The head was brought on a platter and given to the girl 
who brought it to her mother. His disciples came and took the body and buried it, then went and told Jesus. I mean, continuing is the feeding of the 5,000. Now, when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had com compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, this is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the village and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, we have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to his disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds at all and all ate and were filled. And they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, 12 baskets full. And those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. Please be seated. And please join me in a prayer. Heavenly Father, as we now listen to your words and open our hearts and minds to your wants and needs of us, I ask that you let the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. So let me begin with an invitation to each of you here and at home and your families to come to my home for dinner. But you must understand that all I have is five loaves of bread and two fishes to divide between all of us. Hopefully, we will all have enough to eat. What do you think? I think we will all need a lot of faith. As Methodists, we are, or at least before COVID, always having dinners, luncheons, yes, and even breakfast with Santa. And what was always the main question when organizing and setting it up? Do we have enough food for everyone? It amazes me how Jesus, after just hearing of the beheading of his cousin John the Baptist from his disciples, who just returned from burying him, could continue his ministry and feeding his followers with faith, healing, and food. I think of how devastated I was a little over a month ago, hearing of the death of my very special friend, and we all know she was fighting something bigger than all of us. Diane never stopped fighting till the day she passed, and never lost her faith that she would beat this terrible disease of pancreatic cancer. But God decided, as I said at her memorial service, that it is time to bring her home to him time to take away her pain, and since she spent most of her life taking care of others, it was time for him to take care of her. Do you notice how many times people say, I never lost faith that it would all work out as it should or as God wants it to? This made me wonder what exactly the word faith actually means. So going to my second favorite book after the Bible, Webster's Dictionary, I looked up the word faith, and here's what it says. There were actually two meanings. The first, complete trust or confidence in someone or something. Strong, second, strong belief in God or in the doctrines of a religion based on spiritual apprehension rather than proof. Is that not what we do every day? It is, is it not what Jesus did every day? Believe that God is there for you, and if we believe in him, and that he will always be there for us, that we will succeed or survive or accomplish whatever we are doing, or that we will have what we need, be it good or bad, being healed from an illness, loss of a job or a home. I could continue this list, but you get the point. Our choir sings a song titled, 
have faith. In it are phrases like, have faith, God is always near, stay the course, and he will right what is wrong, and things like that. You may not be able to see him, but if you have faith, God is always there when we need him, and if we just believe or have faith. When I thought of my pain and sadness over the loss of Diane and of Jesus' pain over the loss he just suffered, I wondered if I had the passion or compassion to do as he did and continue on. My first dilemma was which word of those two was the correct one? So I once again went to my second favorite book and looked them up in the dictionary. I was surprised at what I found. The definition of compassion is sympathetic pity and concern for the sufferings or misfortune of others. Well, I am not sure that this fits the situation. I somehow do not think Jesus would want us to pity him during this time. And I know I wouldn't want it either. Would you want to be pitied during your time of sorrow or loss? My guess is no, you would not want this either. I also do not think victims of violence, racism, discrimination, etc., would want pity either. So I then looked up passion. The definition of passion is strong and fairly controlled emotion. Now that makes more sense to me. But if Jesus was is distraught over his cousin's violent death, does he want people to offer passion to him? I am not sure, therefore, that that works either. My guess is he was feeling devastation, but that did not stop him from doing what he had to do, feeding the people, all 5,000 of them. Or was it 5,000? I read in a Canterbury Canticle that actually there were 5,000 men plus women and children, totaling up to 10,000 or more in all. That makes this feeding even larger than a regular miracle. When Jim and I got remarried in 1995, he wanted to hire someone to cater it. And I told him, no, I will take care of it myself since I, have, I love to cook for groups. And we were only having our reception at the Parsonage in New Britain, in United Methodist Church. And it was only going to be a small group of 10 to 15 people. Nah. I said, I'll be, it will be no problem and I could just make all the food myself, take it up from Milford the day before. And the women from one of my previous churches said they would handle the setting up on that day of the wedding and serving everything. Easy, right? How hard could it be? Well, first, there was 75 plus people at the wedding. So much for 10 to 15. Next, that meant all of my lists and schedules, which were no longer any good. In the middle of all of the food scheduling and making, there was invitations, flowers, outfitting two very young girls, ages two and nine, my daughters who were of course full grown and one was pregnant, my own dress for the wedding, suit for gym, scheduling a rehearsal dinner, which turned out to be for over 20 people. Well, you get the picture. But with a lot of lists, a great many prayers, and a lot of faith, some very big help from my family, as there were five of us living in the same house in Milford, Jim always used to like to call us his four personal harem girls. We did it all, and the wedding was a great success, and everyone had a great time. As a matter of fact, there was so much food left over after everyone ate to their full extent that we actually loaded a carload of food and delivered it to the local food bank for distribution to those in need. I will admit that there were times during the entire process that I was concerned about the standing question of, will there be enough food for everyone to eat? But I never lost my faith that God would provide, and he did abundantly. I had something that Jesus did not have. I could make lists, my favorite thing to do, as you all know, and I had time to work it all out. So you see, my five loaves and two fishes were enough. And with faith, God did provide. Jesus did not have that advantage of making a list and planning ahead. He did, however, have abundant faith in his Father in heaven. He came back to shore upset and distraught and was faced with a situation that needed addressing right away. 
True, he could have told his followers to tell everyone to go back to their own homes and fix up food for themselves and their families, but he did not do that. Instead, he told his disciples to have the people sit down and then bring him the food they had. He was going to fix the problem the way his father wanted him to. I kept thinking of the phrase, with God, all things are possible, as Paul stated in the letter read earlier from Ephesians. We recently spent a year and a half basically in quarantine. With that came isolations and lockdowns, including, of course, our church. People out of work and either working at home or on unemployment. People were sick, and yes, some of them dying, sadly. People could not get to the stores to buy groceries or anything. Well, as Methodists, our first thought was call all the members of the church and organize a casserole brigade, because after all, that is what we do. I think God created Methodists for that purpose, and that is why we are so good at it. We, however, know that in this particular time of crisis, it was not possible to spring into action. So we will hold our fishes and loaves for another time when needed. We currently are in a very tumultuous world. There is mass shootings, wildfires, floods, physical abuse, discrimination, and the list just keeps going and going. The world has lost its faith and stopped remembering the words from the Bible. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Feeding is not always providing food per se though we Methodists take it always our first thought. Feed your souls and then go out and face the world to help make it a better place for all of God's children, no matter what their color, religion, sexual preference, occupation, etc., etc., etc. I would like to challenge each of you to try an experiment. We all have things in our lives that are a challenge. Take those challenges in your life to Jesus in prayer. But while turning these challenges over to him, listen to him and learn how he wants you to let go and find a way to feed the 5,000. Amen? Amen? Amen. Our hymn of response is Spirit Song number 347. Please rise if you are able.
for your forgiveness. You will so often forget that you are God and a Savior. We forget to thank you for the blessings you give us, to praise you with my life's ability, to share your love and love with others. It is much easier to blame you or anyone else if things are going wrong in our lives. It is much easier to take credit for ourselves when the things are going well. Forgive us, Lord, and help us to remember that you are God and that through you and in you alone all things are possible. Amen. Let us now lift our prayers to say. To hear these words of assurance. Hear the good news. Christ died for all of us that we should live forever, both here on earth and in his kingdom with the Father. Amen. And now let us lift up our prayers of joy and concern. I have one. Um, prayers are asked for Carol Young. She has a heel infection and cannot get out of bed. And that was uh, brought by Donna, her daughter. So, um, this one. Um, I'd also like to ask that you continue praying for Brenda and Joshua Panalone and the loss of Bob. Um, it's great to see you this morning, Brenda. You have all of our thoughts, prayers, and love, of course, you and Joshua both. Um, is there any other prayers? Cheryl? My sister asked that we add her to the prayer list. Her name is Kelly, and she's recently had some um, blood tests that would suggest uh, things are not good. So she's very worked up about it and uh, would appreciate uh, prayers from our church family. Thank you, Cheryl. That's for Cheryl's sister, Kelly. Gail? Yes, um, just a continuance on a young man, Brandon, we're praying for. Um, he has cancer. He had um, a long, long surgery Friday, and the doctors are hopeful that they have all the cancer. And uh, just keep praying for Brandon. He's 18 years old and has an unsettling feeling about this, you know, being such a young fellow. Um, he will have to continue some treatments, but that is good. And he'll be good at it. Yeah. I'm also going to embarrass Rose. <laughs> um, I'd like to, you know, ask first for Rose. She's in a lot of transition right now with moving and 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 downsizing and everything. And having just gone through that and, and actually still going through that, I totally understand where she's coming from. And so all she's going to need all the prayers she can get because it is very. It's very mind-boggling. It is. It's it's distressing and it's tough. So prayers for Rose and her family. Are there any other Cheryl, are there any online or anything? No. Daddy? I'd like to offer prayer for our athletes and all the athletes that are at the Olympics. Mm -hmm. I know um, this was uh, a time when they weren't sure about doing this, but they are doing it. So I think we can offer prayers for their safety uh, while they're there and, and they're determined. And since we've all been waiting for the birth of a baby, it has not happened yet. <laughs> she is very, very pregnant and just wants it over with. But she's decided that the baby's going to wait till it has its college diploma and then it's going to <laughs> So that was her last words to me. So fingers crossed. And, um, and then I'd also like to indulge I'd like to welcome some of my friends that came this morning. My neighbor, Dottie, my friends, Brenda and Mike are here. And um, so we all welcome you and glad to have you here. I'm very glad to have you all here, so thank you. Well, I love, as a follow-up, I, uh, most of you know Michael had a skateboarding accident back in May and had surgery on his 
clavicle. Uh, last week he was given clearance from his doctor to he can now do his uh, final swim stroke, the butterfly, which is his specialty. Um, and so he actually has also qualified for an Eastern Zone to meet up in Buffalo, New York. So mom and swimmer will be driving six and a half hours to Buffalo in 10 days, you know, two days after we move into our apartment. <laughs> so yes, uh, I appreciate the extra prayers, but we are very happy for Michael because this puts him on uh, the right path for starting college and that swim team. So prayers that he will continue to, of course, um, heal. Because there is some healing there, but uh, he's well on his way. That's great news. Thank you, Liz. Any other joys or concerns? I guess I got to throw it in. We signed a contract to sell our house and we're in transition too. So um, just a couple of prayers for us that everything goes well and we get out in good time. Where are you going? We're, we're just going to go to trouble. No worries. No okay. Worries. Let's make sure we're not losing you. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> Any other prayers, joys or concerns? Wonderful. Nice to see you. Um, then please join me in prayer. Gracious and faithful Father, we come to you this morning as your humble servants, asking that as you heard our joys and concerns raised up, as well as those that are in our hearts, we ask that you continue to watch over us, guide us, lead us, and remind us that you are our one true God and that you are always going to be there as long as we have faith. Please continue to help those who are ill, fighting addictions, in need of your love and support, support suffering from job loss, are homeless, suffering from abuse, and Lord, you know the list just keeps on going and going. We thank you, Lord, for being there for all of us and never giving up on any of us, even when we give up on you or ourselves. Please continue to watch over our church in Monroe and continue to guide us to do what you would have us do. Please bless our Pastor Chuck and his family as they are away spending some quality time together and give them safe travels home, bringing them back renewed and refreshed. Bless all of the Methodist churches as well as all of your churches, our church leaders, our world leaders, all of your people in the world, and help them to see that you your main commandment is to love one another as you love us. We ask all of this in your name as we pray the prayer that you thought that your son Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and give us our trespasses and now we continue to ask that you place your offerings in the plate when you come in because um, um, word from the bishop is still ushers are not to pass the plate on Sunday mornings. So we thank those that mail them in and those that pay them online. And if you are bringing them here, please put them in the plate as you enter to make it easier. And now, if we could just present our offering. Here are our logos and dishes, as well as our stuff. We 
you choose these offerings and us to serve you and to do what lets us to do. And we thank you, Lord, for always providing what we need when we need it, and only asking us to love and serve you and to use you in return. In your name we pray. Amen. And now our sending him is What a Friend We Have in Jesus, number 526 in your hymnal.
Hey, everybody. Hi, everybody. Hi, folks. Hey, Thanks for you guys. guys. Carol, hope you're feeling better. We heard you, Carol, but good the... job. What? And then Cheryl's doing a good job too. Yep. Donna, how are you doing? The poor old Mets aren't winning all they should, should they? Hey, you can't win them all. But That's they're right. still in first. That's right. <laughs> hey, it was a good well, service today. Very nice service. That's Anita did a great job and Rose. Don't envy Rose all her commotion with changing things around. I want to know what that's about. Huh? I wouldn't know anything about moving. Yeah, right. I've lived in the same bedroom since I was five. Really? Isn't that incredible? There's people in there. There's Anita, good job there, lady. Yeah, she may have already left the precocious mops. All right. I'll talk to you. She was there. Yeah. <laughs> and Rose and Good program, good service. Yep. We're up in the mountains, so we couldn't be there if we tried. <laughs> we appreciate you joining remotely, Dave. Well, it's good. You. And Amy did a good job with making all the connections there. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, team, team effort, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. All right, we're going to wrap. It's hard to hear you guys, but uh, we'll leave the okay. session going. Okay. Thank you, Cheryl. Have a good week. Thank you. Good week, everybody. Jim, if you're there, take care. Bye. Bye, guys. Okay. Bye-bye.